In the vast tapestry of the cosmos, where mysteries unfold at every corner, we embark on yet another journey of discovery. From the volcanic terrains of Io to the familiar craters of our moon, from the intriguing atmospheres of K218b to the icy landscapes of Triton and the magnetic allure of Ganymede, Join us as we traverse the celestial wonders of our universe. As we venture beyond the known, we'll explore the potential homes of the future, the enigmatic worlds that challenge our understanding of life and existence. Dive deep with us into the cosmic dance of these celestial bodies and ponder the possibilities they present. Are we on the brink of uncovering secrets that have eluded us for eons? Only time and space will tell. In the vast expanse of our solar system, among the spinning gas giants and icy celestial bodies, there is a world so volatile, so extreme, that it defies what we thought we knew about planetology. Welcome to Io, the volcanic wonder of the solar system. This distant moon of Jupiter, shrouded in tranquility, holds a mystery a mystery is so bright that it colors the moon's surface red and orange. However, it is not a peaceful world, but a celestial body in a storm of constant change. Io, Jupiter's third largest satellite, is involved in a cosmic tug of war, a gravitational dance with its parent planet and other moons. This celestial ballet results in enormous tidal forces that cause Io's surface to surge up and down by as much as 330 feet. This gravitational torment ignites the most spectacular volcanic phenomenon in the solar system, with hundreds of active volcanoes, some spewing lava tens of miles into its thin, waterless atmosphere Io is the most volcanic world we know. Fresh, stunning images taken by NASA's Juno spacecraft during the 51st flyby of Jupiter have revealed the fiery heart of Io in unprecedented detail. But they are more than just pictures. They are clues to unlocking the mysteries of our solar system. Looking at these fiery landscapes from our blue and peaceful home, we're reminded how diverse and unique our solar system can be. So join us on a journey to Io, the volcanic wonder of the solar system. Welcome to exploring the fiery world of Io. Io, Jupiter's third largest satellite, is a world of extremes. It is the most volcanically active body in our solar system, with hundreds of volcanoes that spew lava fountains tens of miles high. This volcanic activity is not the result of internal heat left over from its formation, but rather a product of its unique orbital dance with Jupiter and its neighboring satellites, Europa and Ganymede. Io's orbit is more elliptical than it would naturally be due to the gravitational influence of Europa and Ganymede. As a result, Io experiences tremendous tidal forces that cause its surface to surge up and down by as much as 330 feet. This gravitational ballet generates a significant amount of heat within Io, forming massive amounts of magma. Io's volcanoes are often shaped like cauldrons pressed into the Earth's crust, known as patera. Sometimes they contain lava flows that spurt outward, and often their explosions lift matter upward. The composition of this lava is still a matter of debate among scientists. Some theories suggest that it's mostly molten sulfur and its compounds, while others suggest it is silicate rock. 
Although the moon is about 4.5 billion years old, Io's surface itself is no more than a couple of million years old due to its abundant lava production. This constant renewal of the surface fills any impact craters left by meteorites with lakes of molten lava and forms fresh, smooth floodplains of liquid rock. One of Io's most intriguing features is Loki Patera, the moon's most powerful volcano. Responsible for a staggering 10% of the moon's total heat, Loki Patera is a volcanic mystery. The moon's cycle of increasing and decreasing brightness appears to correspond to changes in Io's elliptical orbit, but more data is still needed to confirm the pattern. Interestingly, the bright eruptions appear to be prevalent in the posterior hemisphere of Io, the backside of the moon in terms of its orbital motion around Jupiter. This volcanic gradient is currently explained and adds to the mystery of this volcanic wonder. In addition, the locations of Io's volcanoes do not match any of the major heating models, which adds another layer of mystery to our understanding of this moon. As we delve deeper into Io's volcanic activity, we find more questions than answers, reminding us of the immense complexity of our solar system. When we think of volcanoes, we often envision the majestic and sometimes deadly structures that dot our planet's landscape. From the explosive eruptions of Mount St. Helens to the slow, creeping lava flows of Kilauea. Earth's volcanoes are a prime example of the dynamic nature of our planet. But when we turn our gaze to Io, we find a much more extreme volcanic landscape. The gravitational influence of Jupiter and the other satellites create powerful tidal forces within Io, resulting in extreme volcanic activity. In this world, volcanoes are the norm, not the exception. The scale and intensity of Io's volcanoes dwarf those on Earth. Io's most active volcano, Loki Patera, is a huge lava-filled basin more than 125 miles in diameter. Its eruptions can produce enough lava to cover an area the size of New Jersey. In contrast, Earth's largest volcano, Mauna Loa, has a caldera less than four miles wide. The composition of the lava on Io is also different from that on Earth. While terrestrial volcanoes mostly spew silicate-based lava, the lava on Io is thought to be mostly composed of molten sulfur and its compounds. This is the same substance that gives Io its characteristic bright coloring. The impact of volcanic eruptions on planetary conditions also differs dramatically between Earth and Io. On Earth, large volcanic eruptions can have a significant impact on our climate, often resulting in temporary global cooling. On Io, on the other hand, constant volcanic activity has created a thin atmosphere composed mostly of sulfur dioxide. A powerful volcanic eruption was seen on Io in 2022, highlighting the satellite's extreme volcanic nature. The eruption was so powerful that it illuminated the sodium cloud surrounding Jupiter, known as Io's plasma torso. The event was a stark reminder of the incredible forces raging on this volcanic satellite. However, that only makes Io more interesting. Being the innermost of Jupiter's four Galilean satellites presents a world of extremes. Its intense volcanic activity, caused by the gravitational tug of war between Jupiter and the other Galilean satellites, has far-reaching consequences that extend beyond its gray-covered surface. Io's impact on nearby celestial bodies is significant. Its volcanic eruptions eject large amounts of material into space, some of which falls back to Io's surface, and 
and the rest is either lost to space or forms a ring of charged particles around Jupiter known as Io's already mentioned plasma torso. This torso contributes to Jupiter's magnetosphere, the very region of space dominated by Jupiter's magnetic field. Particles in the torso interact with Jupiter's magnetic field to create bright auroras in the planet's upper atmosphere. The long-term effects of Io's volcanic activity are still the subject of ongoing research. What is certain, however, is that the constant rejuvenation of Io's surface due to volcanic activity has a significant impact on its geology and could potentially affect its ability to support life. Io, as the most volcanically active body in our solar system, as already mentioned, is a world of extremes. Its surface is a hellish landscape constantly altered by hundreds of sulfur volcanoes spewing hot lava. The satellite's surface temperature averaged minus 202 degrees Fahrenheit, while volcanic hotspots can reach a scorching 2,900 degrees. It's hard to imagine life as we know it surviving under these conditions. Yet, life on Earth is incredibly resilient able to survive in the most extreme conditions. We call these hardy organisms extremophiles. They thrive in conditions that would be deadly to most life forms, from the crushing depths of the ocean to the boiling springs of Yellowstone. Astrobiologist Dirk Schultz Mackuck suggests that if there is life on Io, it's most likely underground. Despite the hostile conditions on the surface, the subsurface could be a haven. It could protect any organisms from Jupiter's powerful radiation and so could contain enough heat and moisture for life to survive. One possible habitat for life on Io could be lava tubes, these natural channels through which lava flows beneath the surface of a lava flow should be quite common on Io because of its volcanic activity. As an example, on Earth, microbial growth is common in lava tubes, regardless of location or climate. Could the same be true for Io? If life existed on Io, it would probably be very different from anything we've seen on Earth. It would have evolved to survive in a unique and hostile environment. Potentially, organisms could use sulfur compounds like hydrogen sulfide as an energy source they might even use hydrogen sulfide as a water substitute since it dissolves organic compounds and remains liquid in Io's subsurface environment. The possibility of life on Io is still a matter of speculation, but still it can't be ruled out. Future missions, such as the proposed Io Volcano Observer, may provide more clues about what's going on inside Io and whether life can be sustained there. Looking ahead to future missions, it's worth noting that our understanding of Io and its volcanic activity has greatly improved through ongoing research and exploration. NASA's Juno spacecraft, which has been orbiting Jupiter since 2016, has provided us with the most unprecedented views of Io. Juno's Jovian Infrared Aural Mapper, or JIRAM, has been instrumental in providing detailed images of Io's surface, revealing numerous pockets of volcanic activity. JIRAM is a key player in our quest to learn more about Jupiter's system by measuring the heat radiated by the planet in the infrared wavelength of about five microns. These images allowed scientists to study Io's volcanic activity in detail. By observing the moon during several passes, scientists were able to track how volcanoes vary, how often they erupt, how bright and hot they are, and whether they are clustered or erupting singly. This comprehensive study of Io helped scientists understand the mass and energy flows on this volcanic satellite, and of course paves the way for future research and discoveries. The future holds very exciting prospects for the exploration of I.O. 
Upcoming Juno flybys will bring the spacecraft even closer to Io, leading to twin flyby encounters when it passes a second time just 900 miles from the moon's surface. Such close encounters will provide an even more detailed view of Io's volcanic activity. In addition to Juno, the Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, or JUICE mission, which is expected to reach Jupiter by 2031, will further study Jupiter's large satellites. While JUICE's primary targets are the oceanic satellites Europa and Ganymede, the data it collects will undoubtedly contribute to our understanding of the entire Jupiter system, including Io. By the way, we've already looked at these unique satellites in our previous videos. The scientific goals of such missions are not only to understand Io and its volcanoes, but also to gain insight into the dynamics of our solar system. The data collected will help scientists answer fundamental questions about the formation and evolution of planetary bodies, the conditions that can support life, and the cosmic forces at work in our corner of the universe. The Io Volcano Observer, IVO, that we mentioned earlier is a proposed mission to investigate Jupiter's satellite Io to understand tidal heating as a fundamental planetary process. The main goals of the study are to understand how and where tidal heat is generated within Io how tidal heat is transferred to the surface, and how Io evolves. These results are expected to have direct implications for the thermal history of Europa and Ganymede, as well as providing insights into other tidally heated worlds such as Titan and Enceladus. The mission is designed to use Io as a planet-sized natural laboratory to better understand processes that are important to the entire solar system and have a significant impact on exoplanets. The proposed baseline launch will reach Jupiter in August of 2033 on a Mars-Earth Gravity Assist or MEGA trajectory that's using the effects of Mars and Earth gravity. During the core mission, IVO will approach Io nine times over a period of four years. Exploring Io is not without its challenges. The moon's extreme volcanic activity and the intense radiation around Jupiter pose significant risk to the spacecraft. But with every challenge comes opportunity, an opportunity to push the boundaries of our knowledge and to innovate and discover. In the vast expanse of space, it hangs in our sky, a silent guardian, a constant companion, the moon. Our moon, for thousands of years, has been a source of wonder and inspiration, a muse for poets, a guide for sailors, and a stepping stone for explorers. We've studied it, walked on it, and even brought pieces of it back to Earth. Nevertheless, it continues to hold secrets and captivate us with its mysterious appearance. We now stand at the threshold of a new era of lunar exploration. The Artemis missions are a bold venture that promises to take us further than ever before and reveal truths formed over billions of years. Did you know that deep beneath the crater-cut surface of the moon is its solid iron core? or that there is water ice hidden in the shadows of its craters. And that's just the beginning. From stunningly detailed images revealing its true colors to groundbreaking geological discoveries, we're learning more about our celestial neighbor than ever before. Let's dive into the fascinating world of lunar discoveries. Before we delve into the future, let's take a moment to look into the past the moon has been a part of human history since time immemorial, a constant presence in our night sky, inspiring awe and curiosity. 
Ancient civilizations around the world revered the moon, weaving it into their myths and legends. They tracked its phases, creating the first lunar calendars, which are still used in some cultures today. The invention of the telescope in the 17th century was a turning point in the study of the moon. Astronomers such as Galileo Galilei were able to observe the moon with unprecedented accuracy. Discovering its mountainous terrain and vast flat plains or seas as they were called. Let's go back to the 20th century to the era of the space race. The launch of Sputnik by the Soviet Union in 1957 provoked fierce competition between the world's superpowers, culminating in NASA's Apollo program. In 1969, Apollo 11 made history. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin were the first humans to set foot on the surface of the moon, a moment that fascinated millions of people around the world. The Apollo missions brought many lunar samples and data, changing the way we think about the moon. Since then, many missions to the moon have been launched in various countries, each contributing to our growing body of knowledge. We've mapped the surface of the moon in detail, discovered traces of water ice, and studied its geology, atmosphere, and magnetic field. The Artemis I mission marks a new chapter in our exploration of the moon. Named after Apollo's twin sister from Greek mythology, Artemis carries the torch of lunar exploration into the 21st century. Launched by NASA, Artemis I was an uncrewed test flight that took the Orion spacecraft around the moon. The mission was an important step in testing Orion's systems and capabilities paving the way for future manned missions. During its voyage, Orion flew farther from Earth than any other human-built spacecraft had ever flown. It made a six-day voyage around the moon collecting valuable data and testing its systems in the harsh conditions of deep space. The mission provided us with stunning images of the lunar surface taken by Orion's onboard cameras. These images not only provide a glimpse of the stark beauty of the moon, but also serve a practical purpose in helping scientists and engineers appreciate the operation of Orion systems and instruments. After completing its orbit of the moon, Orion returned to Earth, reaching a speed of 20,000 miles per hour on re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere. The successful landing and recovery of the spacecraft marked the end of the mission and the beginning of a new era of lunar exploration. The Artemis I mission was a testament to human ingenuity and the exploratory spirit. It was the result of the hard work and dedication of countless people working toward a common goal, to return humans to the moon and one day make the next giant leap to Mars. Our closest celestial neighbor is more than just a beautiful object in the night sky. It is a treasure trove of information about the early solar system, and its geology holds clues to its own fiery birth and tumultuous history. The moon's surface is a rugged landscape of mountains, valleys, and plains mottled with countless craters. These features tell the story of a place bombarded by meteorites and of the volcanic activity that once occurred on its surface. The rocks delivered by the Apollo astronauts told us a lot about the composition of the moon. They showed us that the moon's crust is mostly composed of a rock called basalt, formed from rapidly cooling lava. One of the most intriguing recent discoveries about the moon is deep beneath its surface in its core. For a long time, the nature of the lunar core remained a mystery, but recent research has shed new light on its composition. Like the Earth, the moon has a layered structure with a crust, a mineral-rich mantle, and a core. But unlike the Earth's molten outer core, the moon's core is thought to be mostly solid. This conclusion is based on data from seismometers placed on the moon by the Apollo missions. These instruments record lunar tremors or moonquakes, vibrations that pulsate in the moon's interior. 
By studying these vibrations, scientists can infer the structure and composition of the moon's interior, similar to the way a doctor uses an x-ray to look inside a patient. The solid iron core is important to our understanding of the moon's past. It suggests that the moon once had a magnetic field created by the cooling of this iron core. This magnetic field may have protected the surface of the moon from solar radiation, just as Earth's magnetic field does today. A solid iron core also helps explain some of the volcanic activity of the moon. When the core cooled and solidified, the moon had to shrink, releasing heat and causing volcanic eruptions. These eruptions shaped the surface of the moon, forming its vast plains and filling its craters with lava. Finally, the solid iron core provides insight into the formation of the moon and the early solar system. This supports the theory that the moon was formed from the debris of a giant collision between a young Earth and a Mars-sized body. This violent origin would have left the moon with a molten ocean of rocks that slowly cooled over billions of years to form the moon as we know it today. As we continue to explore and study our closest celestial neighbor, who knows what other secrets we'll uncover. Every part of the moon, from its surface to its core, has a story to tell. Water. It is the essence of life as we know it. And for a long time, we thought that the moon, with its barren, airless surface, was devoid of it. But recent discoveries have turned that assumption upside down. As we know, the surface of the moon is dotted with countless craters. These places, especially near the poles of the moon, are in constant shadow protected from the heat of the sun. In these eternally dark craters, temperatures can drop to minus 418 degrees Fahrenheit low enough to trap water ice for billions of years. Indeed, several missions have found traces of that very water ice in them. NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, or LRO, was instrumental in this discovery. LRO has been making unprecedentedly detailed maps of the moon's surface since 2009, and its data has revealed the presence of ice in the polar craters of the moon. Another mission, LCROSS, Observation and Sensing Satellite, dramatically confirmed the presence of water ice on the moon. In 2009, a rocket exhaust stage crashed into a crater near the moon's south pole. The impact raised a plume of debris, which was analyzed by the LCROSS tracking spacecraft. The analysis revealed a significant amount of water ice. Although the discovery of water ice in lunar craters was a significant breakthrough, recent research has taken our understanding of lunar water to new heights. A recent study revealed a detailed map of water distribution near the moon's south pole. This map was created using data from NASA's Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, SOFIA. It shows the possible location of water ice near the moon's south pole. The map reveals a complex picture of the moon's hydration. Water is not evenly distributed across the south pole, but it is concentrated in certain craters and regions. Where lunar water can come from, whether it is ancient and exists by itself in lunar minerals from early volcanic processes on the moon, or delivered by asteroids, comets, or solar winds, and whether it migrates across the moon's surface is another important question left open by SOFIA observations. This detailed map of the distribution of water on the moon is not just a scientific achievement. It's a roadmap for future lunar exploration. Knowing where water is located is crucial for planning future missions, especially those that aim to ensure a sustained human presence on the moon. Water is a valuable resource in space. It can be used for drinking, growing food, and providing oxygen for breathing. But perhaps most importantly, water can be broken down into hydrogen and oxygen, components of rocket fuel. That means that lunar water could be used to refuel spacecraft. 
This makes the moon a potential refueling station in space for missions going farther out into the solar system, such as Mars. When we think of the moon, we often imagine a barren, airless world. But did you know the moon has an atmosphere? It's incredibly thin and rarefied, but it exists and is the subject of intense scientific research. The moon's atmosphere is known as the exosphere, the thinnest type of atmosphere there is. It is so rarefied that individual molecules rarely collide with each other. Instead, they follow ballistic trajectories like tiny rockets. The moon's exosphere is composed of various gases, including helium, neon, and argon, as well as traces of other elements. These gases are released from the lunar soil in a process known as degassing. NASA's Lunar Atmosphere and Dust Environment Explorer, or LADY, was a mission specifically designed to study the lunar exosphere. Launched in 2013, LADY made detailed measurements of the composition and structure of the exosphere, as well as the lunar dust environment. One of the key discoveries of LADY was the discovery of a dust cloud hovering above the lunar surface. This dust rises into the exosphere as a result of micrometeorite impacts, creating a temporary, ever-changing dust exosphere. As we prepare for future lunar missions, understanding the exosphere of the moon will be critical. It can affect landing and takeoff conditions and may even pose a hazard to astronauts and equipment. Just as our understanding of the moon's exosphere has been enhanced by modern technology and scientific missions, so too has our ability to visualize the moon's surface increased. In this era of advanced astronomy, we've been able to capture the stark landscape of the moon in stunning detail, offering us a closer look at our celestial neighbor. From the earliest photographs taken by lunar orbiters to high-resolution images taken by modern telescopes and spacecraft, we've seen lunar craters, mountains, and valleys in exceptional detail. One of the most outstanding images of the moon was recently created by astrophotographers Andrew McCarthy and Connor Mathern. This image is not just one image, but consists of more than 200,000 images taken in one evening and carefully stitched together to create a breathtakingly detailed portrait of the moon. The entire image is assembled like a mosaic, each tile consisting of thousands of photos. This process, known as stacking, increases the signal-to-noise ratio of the image improving detail and reducing the effects of atmospheric turbulence. The final image is a spectacular 174 megapixel masterpiece. It shows the moon in stunning detail with every crater, mountain, and valley visible. The image also shows subtle color variations in the lunar surface caused by differences in the composition of the lunar soil. Creating such a detailed image of the moon is not an easy task. It requires not only advanced equipment and clear skies, but also a thorough understanding of image processing techniques. Each photograph must be carefully aligned and merged, which takes hundreds of hours, but the result is more than worth it. Detailed images like this one aren't just beautiful. They're also a valuable tool for scientists to help them study the geology of the moon track changes on its surface, and plan future missions. As we look to the future of lunar exploration, one mission stands out as a beacon illuminating the path to our return to the moon. This mission is Artemis II, the next big step in our journey toward understanding our celestial neighbor and our place in space. Artemis II, part of NASA's program, will be the first manned mission to the moon in the 21st century taking a group of astronauts on a journey around the moon. The Artemis II crew is a diverse and talented team of astronauts, including the first woman and the first man of color to participate in a lunar mission. NASA astronaut Reed Wiseman will command the mission, and Victor Glover will be the pilot. 
Canadian Space Agency astronaut Jeremy Hansen and NASA astronaut Christina Hammock Koch will also participate in this historic mission. The goals of the mission are ambitious. Artemis II will be a multi-day mission. It will be a critical test of the Orion spacecraft and Space Launch System rocket, paving the way for future lunar landings. And perhaps most importantly, it will revive the spirit of human exploration, taking us beyond Earth for the first time in five decades. But Artemis II is just the beginning. It's part of a larger plan to establish a sustained human presence on the moon. Future missions will focus on landing astronauts on the surface of the moon. The moon is more than just a destination. It's a stepping stone, a testing ground for the technologies and strategies we need to explore the solar system at greater depth. It's a place where we can learn to live off the Earth using lunar resources to support human missions. As we stand on the threshold of a new era of lunar exploration, we're not just looking at the moon. We are looking beyond to Mars and the distant worlds awaiting our arrival. And on this great journey, the moon is our first stop, a beacon lighting the way to the stars. In the grand theater of the cosmos, Few relationships are as close and intricate as the relationship between the Earth and its partner, the Moon. This relationship, which emerged more than four and a half billion years ago, has determined the fate of our planet and all life on it. The Moon, our constant satellite, orbits us at an average distance of about 238,855 miles. It is the fifth largest satellite in the solar system and, compared to the size of its planet, the largest. As the moon revolves around the Earth, we see different parts of its sunlit side, a cycle that creates the phases of the moon. When the moon retreats into the Earth's shadow, we witness a lunar eclipse, a spectacular event that's captivated people for thousands of years. The gravitational pull of the moon also creates Earth's tides. As the moon orbits, its gravity attracts Earth's oceans, causing them to bulge toward the moon. This bulge creates two tides and two ebbs each day. The moon serves as a shield that protects the Earth from some meteorite impacts. Many of the craters on the moon's surface are scars intended for the Earth. But above all, our satellite played a key role in the development of life on Earth. The gravitational pull of the moon stabilizes the tilt of the Earth's axis, providing a relatively stable climate for a long time, a condition that may have been crucial for the evolution of complex life. As we continue to explore the moon, both from Earth and with missions like Artemis, we don't just learn about our celestial neighbor, we also gain insight into our planet, its history, and its place in space. Have we finally found the answer to one of humanity's oldest questions? Are we alone in the universe? The James Webb Space Telescope may have just brought us one step closer to a revolutionary discovery. Meet K218b, a distant exoplanet that has suddenly found itself at the forefront of astrobiological research. Why? Because James Webb discovered something unusual in its atmosphere, something that could potentially signal the existence of life. Water vapor, Methane and even the rare dimethyl sulfide are not just random molecules. They may be the biosignatures we are looking for, clues that life in some form exists beyond Earth. Armed with the most advanced space technology ever created, James Webb is our new guardian of the galaxy, a telescope designed to peer into the unknown and perhaps redefine our understanding of life itself. So, 
Are you ready to venture into the unknown and dive into the mysterious world of K218B? As we venture deeper into space in search of answers to questions that have puzzled humanity for generations, we rely on the eyes of our technological marvels to bring the universe into focus. One such eye is the James Webb Telescope, or JWST. For decades, the Hubble Space Telescope has been our window to the universe, producing images that have both delighted and enlightened us. But even Hubble has its limitations. Meet James Webb, a telescope dedicated to pushing the boundaries of what we can see and understand. One of the most innovative features of the JWST is its cool screen technology. This is no ordinary sunshade. It's a multi-layered engineering genius the size of a tennis court that blocks the heat of the sun, earth, and moon. Why is this important? Because it allows the telescope to cool to incredibly low temperatures, increasing its sensitivity to the faint infrared signals emitted by distant celestial bodies. Infrared observations are crucial for studying exoplanets such as K218b, Unlike visible light, which can be absorbed or scattered by space dust, infrared waves can overcome such obstacles, giving us clearer and more detailed images. JWST's ability to make infrared observations is not just an achievement. It is a revolution in the way we study distant worlds. So what discoveries await us when we turn his gaze to K218b? Located 124 light years away in the constellation Leo, this exoplanet is more than just a distant rock. You may have heard of the Goldilocks zone, a term describing the habitable zone around a star where conditions are ideal, neither too hot nor too cold for liquid water to exist. K218b orbits around its parent star, K218, in just this zone. But what sets it apart from other exoplanets in similar orbits? K218b is not just another rocky planet. It is what scientists call a Hycean world. Hycean worlds characterized by a hydrogen-rich atmosphere and a surface covered by a watery ocean represent a new frontier in our search for extraterrestrial life. They offer conditions that may be similar to those around hydrothermal vents on Earth, which are known to support diverse ecosystems. Recent observations by the James Webb Space Telescope have revealed intriguing details about the atmosphere of K218b, from water vapor to methane and even potential traces of dimethyl sulfide. The atmosphere of this distant world is a cocktail of elements and compounds that could support life, or at least life as we don't yet know it. The discovery of these atmospheric components has caused a wave of excitement in the scientific community. Researchers are full of excitement and speculation as they ponder the implications of these discoveries for astrobiology and the broader quest to understand the nature of life in the universe. Could this Hycian world with its unique atmospheric composition be the key to unlocking the mysteries of extraterrestrial life? And what might its unique conditions mean for the future of astrobiology? When we venture into the field of exoplanet exploration, one of the most challenging but rewarding aspects is the study of alien atmospheres. K218b, with its unique location in the habitable zone and intriguing atmospheric composition, provides a compelling example. While Earth's atmosphere is a mixture of nitrogen, oxygen, and gas impurities, K218b is a very different cocktail. This exoplanet's hydrogen-dominated atmosphere with traces of water vapor, methane, and perhaps even dimethyl sulfide is a treasure trove of scientific curiosities. Studying the atmosphere of an exoplanet more than 100 light years away is not an easy task. It involves a technique called spectroscopy, 
which analyzes the light from the planet's parent star as it passes through the planet's atmosphere. Different molecules absorb light of specific wavelengths, creating a unique fingerprint that can be deciphered to determine the composition of the atmosphere. The infrared capabilities of the James Webb Space Telescope played an important role in these discoveries. The Mid-Infrared Instrument Spectrograph, abbreviated MIRI, allows for an extended range of wavelengths, allowing it to detect a variety of molecules that were previously elusive. The presence of methane and the lack of ammonia in K218b's atmosphere has scientists speculating about the types of life that might exist there. On Earth, methane is often produced by biological processes, and its presence on K218b opens up the possibility of life forms that thrive in a hydrogen-rich environment, something we've never encountered before. The composition of K218b's atmosphere also suggests the presence of a subsurface ocean. This opens up exciting questions about atmosphere-ocean interactions and how these dynamics might affect the overall habitability of the planet. So could its atmosphere be the key to a new understanding of habitability and life beyond Earth? When we think of life, we often imagine Earth-like environments. But in fact, life exists in environments where we can't even imagine. Studying extremophiles, organisms that thrive in extreme environments, opens up new possibilities for studying life beyond Earth. Deep in Earth's oceans, hydrothermal vents spew hot, mineral-rich water, creating an environment devoid of sunlight, but teeming with life. Extremophiles such as the thermophiles and acidophiles thrive there, challenging our traditional understanding of what life needs to survive. Could such life forms exist on exoplanets like K218b? The hydrogen-rich atmosphere of K218b offers unique conditions for previously unexplored life. On Earth, certain microbes called methanogens produce methane in an oxygen-free environment. If methane in the K218b atmosphere is produced biologically, we may be in a world where hydrogen-loving extremophiles thrive. The study of extremophiles expands the range of conditions in which life can exist. From the acidic rivers of Rio Tinto in Spain to the tundra of Siberia, life on Earth exists in a wide variety of extreme environments. This diversity encourages us to reconsider the ecological limits of extraterrestrial life. The potential for a subterranean ocean and hydrogen-rich atmosphere makes K218b an attractive target for studying extremophiles in the exoplanet environment. Perhaps this distant world has its version of extreme life, adapted to such conditions and considering them a name for itself. If extremophiles do exist on K218b, what might be their evolutionary trajectory? On Earth, life began with simple, single-celled organisms and evolved into complex forms. Could a similar process occur in other worlds given enough time and the right conditions? One of the most interesting aspects of studying the K218b atmosphere is the potential presence of dimethyl sulfide, or DMS. On Earth, this compound is often produced by marine phytoplankton and serves as a potential biosignature. But could its presence on an exoplanet like K218b also indicate life? In the Earth's oceans, DMS is produced by phytoplankton and serves many ecological functions. It is a compound that, when oxidized in the atmosphere, can lead to cloud formation. Its presence in exoplanet atmospheres, such as that of K218b, could be a game changer in the search for extraterrestrial life. The potential detection of DMS on K218b is still being tested. The James Webb Space Telescope's Mid-Infrared Instrument Spectrograph is capable of detecting such complex molecules, but confirming their presence requires careful analysis and expert judgment. 
The discovery of potential biosignatures such as DMS at K218b has excited the scientific community. However, like any groundbreaking discovery, it's also sparked a debate that oscillates between skepticism and optimism. The scientific community is divided on the implications of the discovery of DMS on K218b. While some consider it a strong candidate for biosignatures, others warn that abiotic processes can also produce similar compounds. The debate emphasizes the complexities and challenges in interpreting exoplanet data. Historically, astronomical discoveries have often been met with skepticism. When Galileo first discovered the satellites of Jupiter, his findings were initially rejected by many. Similarly, the discovery of the first exoplanet in 1995 was met with caution. These historical examples serve as a reminder that skepticism is an integral part of the scientific process. The search for extraterrestrial life doesn't depend on a single molecule or observation. Scientists are looking for a combination of biosignatures to create compelling evidence for the existence of life. Could DMS be a part of a larger puzzle involving other biosignatures like methane and water vapor? The debate's likely to continue until additional data is collected. As technology advances, future missions with even more sensitive instruments may provide the confirmation needed to classify the DMS as a true biosignature. Is DMS the key we have been waiting for in the search for alien life, or is it a distraction that is throwing us off track? Either way, the debate itself is a testament to the ever-evolving nature of scientific research. The James Webb Space Telescope has revolutionized our understanding of exoplanets like K218b, but it's just one step in a long journey of space exploration. What lies beyond this monumental mission and how will future technologies continue to expand our cosmic horizons? The extremely large telescope, scheduled for completion by 2025, promises to be another game changer. With a main mirror diameter of 128 feet, it will be the largest near-infrared optical telescope in the world. Its unprecedented sensitivity could confirm or refute the biosignatures detected by the James Webb Space Telescope. The Large UV Optical IR Surveyor, or Louvois, is another mission on the horizon that could complement James Webb's findings. Designed to operate over a wide range of wavelengths, Louvois can provide even more detailed atmospheric analysis and potentially obtain direct images of exoplanets. As we target more distant exoplanets, advances in propulsion technology will be critical. Components like ion propulsion and even theoretical methods involving antimatter propulsion could drastically reduce travel times, allowing probes to reach and study exoplanets within a human lifetime. We've previously published a video on the possibility of interstellar travel and the challenges associated with it. As we stand on the threshold of potentially revolutionary discoveries, it's worth pausing to consider the philosophical implications and questions that fuel our cosmic curiosity. What does the search for extraterrestrial life mean for our understanding of existence and what questions does it pose for the future? One question that's becoming relevant is the role of red dwarfs in the galaxy. Could these numerous stars, often overlooked because of their small size and dim light, actually be the cradle of life? Their longevity and stability make them intriguing candidates for planets that have life. What would the discovery of extraterrestrial phytoplankton mean for our understanding of life? Such a discovery would not only confirm the existence of life beyond Earth, but would also suggest that the building blocks of life are more universal than we thought. What will the next decade reveal in our quest to understand the cosmos? Will we confirm the existence of extraterrestrial life? Or will we discover new, even more complex questions that challenge our understanding of the universe?
In the veiled depths of the solar system lies an enigmatic mystery, Neptune's elusive moon, Triton. Buried in darkness, this seemingly lifeless moon hides features that defy explanation. Unlike other satellites, Triton orbits Neptune in the opposite direction to the normal one, defying the cosmic order. Its cold surface, surprisingly young, occasionally flashes with cryolava, revealing an otherworldly dynamism. But beneath the ice, shrouded in mystery, lies a dense layer that could be covering a bottomless ocean a realm where extraterrestrial life may be kept secret. Come with us on this extraordinary odyssey to the outer reaches of the solar system, ready for a cold but exciting journey into the unknown. Neptune, a blue icy giant pierced by endless ultrasonic winds, is one of the most distant planets in our system, not counting Pluto. It is the only planet we cannot see with the naked eye because of its dimness. 14 satellites are orbiting the icy giant along with Triton. The strange icy satellite was first discovered in 1846 by British astronomer William Lassell through mathematical calculations rather than direct observation due to the imperfect optics for such distant objects at the time. Triton immediately attracted the attention of the scientific community because of its differences from other satellites. All of them are much smaller and, except for some outer satellites, move in their orbit in the direction of the planet's rotation, while Triton rotates in the opposite direction or retrograde. In particular, scientists have noticed that the satellite is unusually similar to the famous dwarf planet Pluto. Their masses, diameters, and even the materials that make up the surface are very similar. But we'll talk about what role this plays for Triton a little later. The diameter of the unique satellite is 1,680 miles, which is almost seven times larger than the second largest satellite of the ice giant Proteus. This size allows it to maintain a thin atmosphere, which is mainly composed of nitrogen and methane. On top of that, the satellite's upper atmosphere has an ionosphere, a place where atoms and molecules are ionized, and more intensely than on Earth. These factors are crucial for suggesting that Triton, like Pluto, may also be an icy dwarf planet. In addition, the ratio of rock to ice on the satellite is in the range of 70 to 30. This adds even more evidence to the planetary nature of Triton, and in particular, hints at a different origin from all other satellites. It is therefore suspected that like the Earth, Triton has a crust, a liquid mantle, and a rocky core. Because of its distance of 2.793 million miles from the Sun, Triton is one of the coldest satellites in the solar system. The average temperature there reaches negative 400 degrees Fahrenheit. The surface of the satellite is covered with a layer of frozen nitrogen, under which there's a thick layer of ice mantle. All of this gives it an icy luster that reflects about 70% of the sunlight that hits it over a long period. In particular, its surface may be quite young, which also hints that Triton is not a dead stone at all, but a rather geologically active planet. Triton has a very interesting dynamic history of its surface development. Its outer layer has many small impact craters, although they should be much larger and deeper. This suggests that the satellite may be recovering in addition, when you look at Triton in detail, you can see large ridges and valleys with complex patterns that look like the skin of a melon and smooth black stripes in some parts of it. However, it does not seem that they could have been formed only by crashing space objects because then Triton would be covered with huge impact basins. Therefore, astronomers have one possible answer to this characteristic landscape, a huge ocean may be hidden under the ice layer. 
Triton's surface is rejuvenated by a mixture of water and nitrogen that settles on its outer layer. But how does water appear on the surface? There are only two ways for water to fill the satellite's surface. Water can be poured out through strong meteorite impacts or its eruption through volcanic plumes in the outer crust. This is also hinted at by Titan's amazing nitrogen polar caps. Their formation depends on cryovolcanism. But wait, how can water erupt on such a cold moon? Triton is strongly influenced by Neptune's gravitational pull, which deforms the satellite's core causing tidal heating, which heats the water inside. In particular, solar heating can also be the cause of cryolava eruptions. Solar radiation passes through the ice, heating the subsurface nitrogen until it escapes through the crust. Water eruptions on Triton can last for more than a year, spewing tens of cubic kilometers of matter to restore affected parts of the surface. Heidi Hamill, a senior researcher at the Institute of Space Sciences, believes that such high geyser eruptions require a powerful source of heat and an ocean. However, the existence of the ocean has not yet been confirmed. There are several hypotheses about the nature of such a young surface. For example, heat from inside the satellite can melt pockets of nitrogen ice, which then erupt outward. In particular, cryovolcanoes may be fed by water not from the subsurface ocean, but simply from pockets of water in the crust. Triton raises many questions about its internal composition, and the only way to find out for sure whether Triton lives up to its name is through missions to the edge of the solar system. The first telescope to take detailed images of Triton was Voyager 2 in 1989. Flying over Neptune's North Pole, Voyager bent its trajectory due to the giant's gravity to reach Triton. At a distance of 25,000 miles, almost at the altitude of geostationary satellites, the telescope captured the very first images of Triton's surface and then departed forever into deep space. It's thanks to these images that we know so much about the mysterious satellite today. The Voyager mission provided a comprehensive characterization of the satellite, including its mass, atmosphere, and composition. For example, it was the mission to Triton that established that the atmosphere is dominated by molecular nitrogen with a small content of methane, which suggested that the satellite could be geologically active and gave rise to the study of the nature of eruptions. In particular, Voyager 2 proved that there are no oceans of liquid nitrogen on Triton's surface and showed the world the features of the satellite's surface. However, the mission to Triton saw only 40% of the satellite, its southern hemisphere, and only one side of it because the satellite itself is always turned with one side toward Neptune. Almost 33 years after Triton's first image, Space Telescope James Webb took a new equally impressive photo of Neptune and Triton, albeit at a much greater distance. Webb has captured the barely visible rings of Neptune and its seven moons for a very long time, but the largest moon of the icy giant has taken all the attention. To the left of Neptune in the image, you can see a very bright star-like object, but it is Triton. Such an outburst of the moon confirms its shiny surface of condensed nitrogen, which reflects almost all the sunlight that gets there. Although the photographs taken over the past 30 years have greatly advanced our knowledge of Triton, there's still not enough to build a complete map of the satellite and answer the most intriguing questions. Therefore, more expeditions to Triton are needed to make sure that all the guesses are correct. Triton's unusual orbit seems particularly interesting for further research. As we've already mentioned, Triton is one of the few satellites that moves against the direction of Neptune's rotation. Retrograde motion, or counterclockwise motion of cosmic bodies, is rare. Only a few satellites in the solar system, like 
Uranus, Saturn, Jupiter, and Neptune have retrograde orbits. Moreover, Triton is also tilted by 23 degrees compared to Neptune's flat path as it rotates. Usually this tilt and reversal of motion is the result of a collision with another body. Therefore, some other object could have collided with Triton in the past the same way and caused the retrograde motion. However, this version is not currently popular in scientific circles. In particular, this scenario does not explain the size and similarity of Triton to dwarf planets. So, what's the main reason for the satellite's alien nature? Neptune's orbit passes right on the border with the Kuiper Belt, a region of the remnants of the solar system and its actual border. It's there that the dwarf planet Pluto is located. There's another possible reason for the formation of a retrograde orbit of a space body. An independent object moving at a certain speed and direction can be captured by another body with a greater gravitational pull. And since it's difficult to model the conditions under which Triton could have formed organically around Neptune, scientists have concluded that Triton was probably captured by Neptune's gravity into its orbit. It's now believed that the satellite could have been an object independent of Neptune in the past, once part of a double planetary system like the pluto charon pair. The gravitational pull of Neptune is much greater than the relationship between two gravitationally bound small objects, so Triton could have become detached from another space body, in part by changing its orbital velocity. In particular, it's believed that Triton was headed for a collision with the icy giant, but its companion planet could have brought it into Neptune's orbit, but was itself ejected from the solar system. But this lost planet was not the only victim of Neptune's gravitational pull. As we mentioned, 13 other satellites are orbiting Neptune. They can be divided into two groups, internal and external. And absolutely all of them have a very small mass. For example, Triton's mass is 99.5% of the mass of everything around the icy giant. Thus, Titan's migration could have destroyed Neptune's previous moons, leaving only small fragments behind. But this applies mostly to the inner group. The outer satellites could have been just as captured by Neptune as Triton, but the icy moon also left its mark here. The third largest moon, Nereid, has a highly elliptical orbit at perihelion. It approaches 858,400 miles and at aphelion, it approaches 5,981,600 miles. It was probably knocked out of its normal orbit by a migrating triton. Although it managed to escape the fatal collision, damaging other satellites, its retrograde orbit means that triton is moving slower than the planet's rotation speed, which is why it's gradually being attracted by it. Therefore, in a few million years, the icy moon is likely to be torn apart by Neptune's gravitational forces, forming a new ring. But while this gloomy scenario is in the distant future, Triton has another interesting feature that's worth exploring now. Even though Triton is completely covered in ice made of condensed nitrogen, the hypothetical ocean beneath this frozen surface layer could be warm and therefore harbor life. Water is a very important factor in the development of life. It serves as the main medium for many biological processes necessary for the birth of any living organisms we know, such as maintaining cellular structure. The ability to form life on Triton is influenced by several other important factors. For example, in addition to geysers that spew subsurface nitrogen, Voyager noticed another strange dark cryovolcanic plume during its expedition. The unusual black color of the five mile high plume is likely due to carbon rich materials. Carbon is the basic building block for the formation of an organism from the simplest to the human life. 
It is currently impossible to determine the exact composition of the hypothetical ocean, but scientists at the American Astronomical Society believe that Triton's ocean depends on the volatile composition of comets and therefore may contain a lot of ammonium, sodium, chloride, and oxygen. However, Triton is very cold, so it is unlikely that complex life as we know it could exist there. Furthermore, although the satellite has a nitrogen atmosphere, just like on Earth, it's very thin, so it will not be able to retain enough heat even with the help of nitrogen clouds in the upper layers. However, the temperature on Triton's surface can still rise, although not to very high levels. In 2010, scientists, using the Very Large Telescope of the European Southern Observatory, discovered that Triton also has seasons, just like on Earth. But they last not three months, but 40 years each. Currently, summer is in full swing on the satellite. During this time, researchers from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology have found an increase in temperature from negative 392 Fahrenheit to negative 389 Fahrenheit. While this may seem like a small increase, it's a lot for a satellite that's so cold. That's why MIT professor James L. Elliott is confident that these are signs of global warming. For every nine years, the temperature could rise by another three degrees Fahrenheit. This means that the evaporated gas could have joined the atmosphere during this period and increased its volume. However, on Triton, the atmosphere cannot be constantly saturated. In the harsher fall and winter months, it will begin to thin until it freezes and settles on the surface. That is, in winter, the atmosphere on the satellite is simply absent and will appear only after it warms up in the spring. However, this does not exclude the possibility of simple, primitive life developing in the water of the satellite. Still, to check for sure whether Triton can answer the question, are we alone, a photo of Voyager and James Webb is not enough. Triton raises a lot of questions, remaining without understatement one of the most intriguing satellites in the solar system. And despite all the difficulty of flying to such a long distance, the curiosity of science still wins out to a certain extent. In the near future, a new proposed Trident mission from NASA was planned for Triton, which would last about 16 years, revealing the secrets of Triton and Neptune. The main goal of the mission was to study the factors that determine the habitability of the satellite as confirmation of the existence of a subsurface ocean and molecular building blocks. In addition, Trident would explore the remaining 60% of the satellite surface, allowing scientists to see the entire geographical picture of Triton. However, Trident failed to win the grant for the 2021 launch, losing out on two other missions, Da Vinci Plus and Veritas which are going to explore Venus. Still, all is not lost for the mysterious Triton. China is also currently considering a nuclear-powered mission to Neptune. In particular, it's possible that NASA will reconsider Trident for an expedition in the future. Trident could reveal more important information about ocean worlds and their geology. Expeditions to Neptune's largest moon could not only find evidence or refute the presence of an ocean there, but if it is present, establish its approximate composition to better understand the possibility of life on the cold moon. The study of such hypothetical and sometimes active ocean worlds as Triton, Mimas, Enceladus, or Europa can change all our ideas about the origins of life and about objects with extreme conditions in general. Therefore, future expeditions will advance our knowledge greatly, closing many of our questions and opening up new mysteries for us. Perhaps soon enough, we'll be able to answer the questions of how global oceans form on icy planets and satellites, what makes them geologically active, and finally, whether we are alone. All thanks to the mysterious cold Triton.
In the vast expanse of our solar system, among the swirling gas giants and rocky Earth-like planets, an intriguing world lurks, a world larger than the planet Mercury, but orbiting not around the Sun, but around the colossal planet Jupiter. This is Ganymede, the largest satellite in our solar system. Ganymede, covered in a thick, icy shell, has attracted scientists for years. Its battered and scarred surface tells a story that's been billions of years in the making, a story we're only beginning to unravel. Beneath its icy exterior, Ganymede hides secrets that could forever change our view of life in the universe. It's currently the only known moon that has its own magnetic field, and deep beneath its surface, there may be more water than all of the Earth's oceans combined. Today we take a trip to this distant moon. We'll study its recent images and delve into the mysteries these images have begun to reveal. Our story began more than four centuries ago in 1610, when a man named Galileo Galilei pointed his primitive telescope at the night sky. He discovered four points of light orbiting the giant planet Jupiter that forever changed our view of the universe. These were Galileo's satellites, and the largest among them was Ganymede. Galileo's observations of these Galilean moons revolutionized our understanding of the cosmos by providing the first evidence that not all celestial bodies revolve around the Earth. Ganymede is the titan among the satellites. Its diameter is about 3,273 miles. It is the largest moon in our solar system, surpassing even the planet Mercury in size. But size isn't the only thing that sets Ganymede apart. Transported to present day, our ability to study Ganymede has kept pace with technological advances. Modern telescopes, both ground-based and space-based, have given us a clearer picture of this distant moon. But it was the advent of space probes that really ushered in a new era of exploration. Spacecraft such as the Galileo Orbiter and the Juno probe have traveled to the Jupiter system to send back to Earth detailed images and data that have allowed us to study Ganymede like never before. These missions have given us a close-up view of Ganymede's surface, revealing its icy terrain and the intriguing patterns etched on it. Ganymede is a moon of contrast. Its surface is a patchwork of two different types of terrain. Darker areas filled with craters and grooves tell of the moon's turbulent past, while lighter areas hint at dynamic and geologically active world. An equally tantalizing aspect of Ganymede lies beneath its icy surface. Scientists believe there is a vast ocean of liquid water beneath the ice, containing more water than all of the Earth's oceans combined. Zeus, known as Jupiter in Roman mythology, took a beautiful mortal boy to become the cupbearer of the gods. This boy's name was Ganymede. It seems appropriate that the moon carries such a large amount of water around Jupiter. But perhaps the most intriguing feature of Ganymede is something we can't see. It's the only moon in our solar system that generates its own magnetic field a trait usually reserved for planets. This magnetic field creates beautiful auroras in Ganymede's rarefied atmosphere, a sight truly worth seeing. The question arises, could this distant, icy world harbor the conditions necessary for life? Our understanding of Ganymede has been greatly enhanced by the daring mission sent to the Jupiter system. One of the most significant of these was the Galileo mission launched by NASA in 1989. Galileo arrived at Jupiter in 1995, embarking on a nearly eight-year mission to study the gas giant and its satellites. The spacecraft made several close flybys of Ganymede, taking detailed pictures of its icy surface and measuring its magnetic field. The data collected by Galileo revolutionized our understanding of Ganymede, revealing its complex geological history and confirming its magnetic field. This feature distinguishes it not only from other satellites, but also from most planets. Ganymede is the only satellite in our solar system that generates its own magnetic field. The magnetic field is created by the movement of molten iron in the core of the celestial body, 
a process similar to that which generates the Earth's magnetic field. However, the main mystery is that judging by the structure of the satellite and its age, the core of Ganymede long ago should have cooled and solidified. But still, how does the Moon create a magnetic field? The answer may lie in a process called tidal heating. As Ganymede orbits Jupiter, the planet's gravitational pull causes the Moon's interior to contract and stretch. To understand tidal heating, let's think about a simple everyday activity – kneading dough. When you knead bread or pizza dough, you're exerting force on it, pushing and pulling in different directions. As you work with the dough, you may notice that it begins to heat up. This is because the force you are applying creates friction within the dough and friction generates heat. That's very similar to how tidal heating works. In the case of Ganymede, the kneading is done by Jupiter's gravitational pull. As Ganymede rotates around Jupiter, the planet's gravity attracts different parts of the Moon with different forces, causing it to bend and stretch. This bending and stretching creates friction within Ganymede and, as with dough, the friction generates heat. This heat could be enough to melt part of Ganymede's interior, creating a layer of liquid metal that would generate the Moon's magnetic field. Among other things, Ganymede's magnetic field is unique in that, unlike Earth's, it's embedded in Jupiter's powerful magnetosphere, creating a complex and dynamic electromagnetic environment. This magnetic field is important for the potential habitability of Ganymede. It creates a magnetosphere around Ganymede that could theoretically protect life on the Moon from harmful solar radiation. In addition, the interaction between Ganymede's magnetic field and Jupiter's magnetosphere produces auroras in Ganymede's thin atmosphere. These auroras have provided scientists with valuable information about the internal structure of Ganymede, for example, confirming the presence of an ocean beneath its surface. More recently, the Juno spacecraft has been studying Jupiter and its satellites. Launched in 2011, Juno's primary mission is to study Jupiter's composition, its gravitational field, magnetic field, and polar magnetosphere. In June 2021, NASA's Juno spacecraft made a close flyby of Ganymede coming within 645 miles of the Moon's surface, taking the most detailed images of the Moon's surface to date. The spacecraft's JunoCam imaging system had only 25 minutes to take images of Ganymede, but in that short time, it managed to take five stunning exposures. Interesting fact. Initially, during development, Juno was not equipped with a camera. It was project manager Scott Bolton who insisted, we've got to put a camera on this thing. And it was indeed a wise decision. These images show Ganymede's complex and intriguing surface, with a mix of darker areas and strong craters and lighter areas and grooves and patterns. The Juno science team is now comparing these images with those from previous missions, looking for any changes that may have occurred over the past two decades. But taking these pictures wasn't easy. Juno had to rush past Ganymede at 12 miles per second and then glide over the tops of Jupiter's clouds at 36 miles per second. Nevertheless, despite these challenges, the spacecraft managed to take clear and detailed images of Ganymede, giving us an unprecedented view of this fascinating moon. These images are not only visually stunning, but they're also key to understanding Ganymede's geology and the potential for life. For example, the images show light and dark areas on Ganymede's ice shell, indicating differences in the purity and composition of the ice. This information can help scientists understand how Ganymede's ice shell formed and how it's changed over time. So let's take a closer look at the dynamic geologic history of this moon. The dark regions are considered the oldest parts of Ganymede's surface, some four billion years old. They are heavily cratered, indicating they have been relatively stable for a long period, bearing the scars of countless impacts. In contrast, the lighter colored groove regions are younger and indicate more recent geologic activity. These regions are modeled with intricate patterns of ridges and ditches, some of them more than a mile high and hundreds of miles long. 
These furrowed landforms are thought to have formed as a result of tectonic activity caused by the previously mentioned tidal heating from Ganymede's elliptical orbit around Jupiter. When the moon bends and stretches under Jupiter's gravitational pull, it releases heat that can cause the icy surface to crack and regenerate. This process can create faults and cracks in the surface, resulting in the ridges and grooves we see today. It is a process similar to plate tectonics on Earth, but in a much colder and alien environment. Thus, by studying these geologic features, we not only learn about Ganymede's past, we also gain insight into geologic processes that may occur on other icy moons and planets, helping us to understand the diversity of worlds in our solar system and beyond. As we delve deeper into the mysteries of Ganymede, one question arises, could this icy moon harbor life? While we don't yet have definitive answers, some features of Ganymede make this a tantalizing assumption. First, it's believed that Ganymede has an underground ocean of liquid water more than 100 kilometers deep. This ocean is warmed by heat generated with tidal bends. On Earth, wherever we find water, we find life. So the presence of a vast ocean on Ganymede opens up the possibility of life there perhaps in an environment similar to Earth's deep-sea hydrothermal vents. These vents, spewing mineral-rich water heated by the Earth's interior, are teeming with life forms that thrive in extreme conditions. Could similar vents exist on Ganymede, providing the conditions necessary for life? Second, Ganymede's thin oxygen atmosphere, although not suitable for human respiration due to the low density, could potentially support some forms of microbial life. On Earth, some microbes are known to survive in extremely rarefied atmospheres, such as those at high altitudes of mountains. Although conditions on Ganymede are harsh and very different from those on Earth, life as we know it has proven to be incredibly adaptable and able to survive in a wide variety of environments. Thus, the possibility of life on Ganymede, while somewhat speculative, cannot be ruled out. As future missions explore this fascinating satellite in more detail, we may yet find answers to these questions. Who knows what secrets Ganymede may reveal? However, it's very important to be aware of the challenges and limitations of exploring such a distant and alien world. First, the sheer distance. Ganymede orbits Jupiter, which is about 484 million miles from Earth. Even traveling at the speed of light, it takes more than 40 minutes for a signal to travel from Earth to Ganymede and back. This makes real-time control of spacecraft impossible and means that missions to Ganymede must be able to operate autonomously for long periods. In addition, the harsh conditions of Ganymede itself make themselves felt, the surface temperature of negative 276 degrees Fahrenheit and it's exposed to intense radiation from Jupiter's magnetosphere. Any spacecraft that visits Ganymede must be designed to withstand these extreme conditions. And finally, there's the problem of interpreting the data we're getting. Images and other data from Ganymede must be transmitted hundreds of millions of miles through space and then analyzed by scientists on Earth. This process requires sophisticated technology and expertise. And there's always some degree of inaccuracy involved. It's not to say that current interpretations are wrong, but rather our understanding of Ganymede is constantly evolving as new data is collected and analyzed. Although the scientific community seems to be in general agreement on the main features of Ganymede, there's also some uncertainties. One major point of contention is the source and nature of the plumes observed on Ganymede's surface. Some scientists believe these plumes are caused by water from the interior of the moon being pushed through its icy crust, similar to the plumes observed on Saturn's satellite Enceladus and possibly Jupiter's satellite Europa. Incidentally, we've already debated whether there is life on Europa in another video. Similarly, while the existence of subsurface ocean on Ganymede is supported by several lines of evidence, the exact properties of this ocean, such as depth, composition, ability to harbor life, all still the subject of ongoing research and debate. Despite these challenges, our quest to explore Ganymede and other distant worlds continue. Each challenge we overcome brings us one step closer to understanding our place in the universe. 
As we traveled through the mysteries of Ganymede, it became apparent that our exploration of this fascinating satellite is far from over. NASA and other space agencies around the world have ambitious plans to explore the Jupiter system. The European Space Agency's JUICE, their mission launched April 14, 2023, from the Guiana Space Center on an Ariane 5 launch vehicle and it will make detailed observations of Ganymede and other Galilean moons, Europa and Callisto. The Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer will be equipped with a suite of 10 advanced instruments capable of studying the surface and interior of Ganymede with unprecedented precision. It'll map the moon's icy envelope and underlying ocean, study the composition of its surface and atmosphere, and further explore its unique magnetic field. Beyond JUICE, there are proposals for even more ambitious missions. These include landers, rovers, and even submarines to explore Ganymede's ocean. While still in the conceptual stage, these missions represent the bold, innovative thinking that will be required to fully unlock the secrets of Ganymede. As we look to the future, one thing is clear. Ganymede remains a tempting place for scientific exploration, its unique geology, magnetic field, and potential for life make it a solid target in the ongoing quest to understand the workings of the solar system and our place in it.